Welcome to the first element from the course. First, I'm going to introduce some important definitions. This here is what we're going to call a line. It is endless in both directions. And this is what we're going to call a point. This here is what we're going to call a line segment, or just segment. It's only the part of a line that is between two points, so it is not endless, unlike the line. Next, I'm going to define two of the most important transformations of the plane. What you're seeing is called translation of the plane, or just sliding. The pi symbol is sliding across the plane, but notice that it is not rotating, so it cannot flip or turn upside down. It is the same shape and the same size. What changes is just its location. Notice that its orientation in terms of which direction it faces does not change. This will be important later on. The other important transformation is the rotation. Here, the pi symbol preserves its shape, size and location, but the direction it faces changes. With this transformation, we can flip it upside down. Each rotation has a center. This is the one point that does not move at all during the rotation. Notice that the point on the screen stays still while the pi symbol is rotating. But how can we measure rotation? How can we quantify how much the pi symbol has rotated from its original position here? For this, we need to introduce degrees. Let's assume a static reference direction with respect to the center of rotation. We are going to measure all rotations relative to that direction. We will also add these perpendicular lines for our convenience. Now we can start measuring how much the blue arrow has rotated relative to the reference direction. If it points towards that direction, then it has not rotated and we say that it makes zero degrees with the reference direction. Let's rotate it a bit counterclockwise. This angle makes 45 degrees and we call it an acute angle because all angles that lie within this quadrant are acute angles. Now let's rotate it some more until it hits the vertical line. This corresponds to a measure of 90 degrees, again relative to the reference direction. Such an angle is called a right angle. Notice that this angle is a quarter of a complete rotation. Turning the blue arrow a bit more, we get 120 degrees. This is called an obtuse angle, because all angles that lie within this quadrant are obtuse angles. If we rotate more until the arrow hits the horizontal line, we get 180 degrees. This is called a straight angle, because now the blue direction and the reference direction make a straight line. Now, if we rotate a bit more, we get a reflex angle. All angles in this half plane are called reflex angles. Finally, we can complete the rotation and call this a full angle, which corresponds to 360 degrees. You can argue that a 360 degrees rotation is the same as a zero degree rotation, as the blue arrow ends up exactly where it started, and for most purposes, you will be correct. To sum up, you have to know that the zero angle corresponds to no rotation, the right angle corresponds to a 90 degree rotation or a quarter turn, the straight angle corresponds to a 180 degree rotation or a half turn, the 270 degree rotation is a three quarters turn, and the 360 degree rotation is a full angle and a full turn. Also, rotations are done counterclockwise. If you perform a clockwise rotation, it will be measured in negative degrees. If you want to add two angles, say this 45 degrees angle and this 30 degrees angle, then you just measure the combined rotation by rotating first 45 and then 30 degrees. This is, of course, the same thing as just rotating 75 degrees. If you wish to subtract, say, 15 degrees from the result, just rotate in the other direction and you will see that we are left with 60 degrees. Complementary angles are those whose sum is a straight angle, like these ones on the screen. We know that 48 plus 132 equals 180, so these two angles are complementary. We can see that two intersecting lines always create complementary angles. More generally, 
we see that if one of these angles is alpha, the other is 180 minus alpha. And if one of them is acute, then the other one is obtuse. Or it could happen that the two angles are right angles. Angles can also complement to a right angle, such as these. We know that 72 plus 18 equals 90, which means that the sum of the two angles is a right angle. We can illustrate the right angle on the picture as shown. More generally, we see that if one of these angles is alpha, the other is 90 degrees minus alpha. You might be wondering why out of all numbers use 360 to measure the full angle. It turns out that it all comes from this picture. The Babylonians were fascinated by it and they used a base 60 counting system, which means that they used 60 different symbols to represent numbers. So they decided to associate each of these six angles with the number 60. Hence they got 6 times 60 equals 360 degrees for the full angle. And why the fascination? Well, because of the property that all the segments on this picture have equal length. We will see why this is the case in a later video. Here is the optional problem. In how many ways can we split the full angle into angles of equal sizes such that each angle is a whole number? For example, we can split the full angle of 360 degrees into four equal parts and each part measures 90 degrees. 90 is a whole number, so this configuration works. So the question is how many such configurations do we have? And here's the solution. It turns out there are 24 ways in which you can split the 360 degrees into angles of whole number sizes. Here you can see a list of all the possible ways. So this means that we split it into one part of 360 degrees. This means that we split it into two parts of 180 degrees each. This means we split it into three parts of 120 degrees each, and so on and so on.